this dramatic image in 2022 received an excellence at the Alberta Image Salon of the Professional Photographers of Canada. It also was the best in class in fine arts and received the judge's choice. It helped Ivan Will, the maker, become the photographer of the year. Welcome to Award-Winning Images Explained. My name is Manpreet and I am your host. Today's guest, Ivan Will, is a landscape and fine art photographer based in Edmonton, Alberta. He owned and operated a commercial studio in Japan before returning to Canada in the mid-2020. He has received numerous awards and recognition for his work including an International Landscape Photographer of the Year Award in 2020 and Back-to-Back -back Photographic Artists of the Year Awards in 2021 and 2022 from the Professional Photographers of Canada, also known as the PPOC, as well as having been chosen to represent Team Canada at the World Phot Photographic Cup. He was also interviewed by CBC Radio not long back. And to top all that, he runs adventure tours and workshops as well. Thrilled to speak with you today, Ivan. Yeah, thank you very much, Manfred. Appreciate the intro. <clears throat> You're welcome. So, tell us, how did you get introduced to photography? And um, talk a little bit about your journey and how Japan came to be in the path, path of your journey. Yeah, certainly. Um, <clears throat> so I've always had an interest in photography. Uh, my grandfather was an avid photographer, and uh, I always liked taking a camera through my uh, my backpacking, like my hiking and backpacking sessions. Uh, but it wasn't. I didn't really kind of pursue photography in earnest uh, until I was living in Australia, and I was working on a farm, a twenty thousand acre farm in Western Australia, and I took a few photos just of the landscapes, and uh, the farmer that I worked for saw it. And uh, he quite liked them, and he offered to pay me for a week to go around his property and photograph, um, you know, photograph the landscapes around his property. So I did that, and yeah, I absolutely loved it. And uh, it was kind of during my travels in Australia, where I was, you know, far away from home and in a unique landscape that really, uh, you know, spurred my interest and uh, wanted to get me to pursue photography. And that's a sweet deal, isn't it? <laughs> it, was, it was great. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And um, you've been all over Australia, Japan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, about Japan. How do you uh, come to be in Japan? Yeah. Uh, so I did. I studied Japanese in junior high and high school. Um, so I had a, a foundational knowledge of Japanese before I went. And I did do a school exchange there when I was in high school. Um, <clears throat> and I had, uh, yeah, so I, I did live in Australia, New Zealand for, for two years, came back to Canada, studied photography. Um, and I went to Japan initially just for a year to, um, to work there, and then I was going to be moving to California right after that. Um, I got a little sidetracked. I got, uh, I got working with um, <clears throat> uh, doing some acting and like with talent agencies in Japan and, um, and photographing at the same time. And just the, the industry there was great. There was, I started doing a lot of model portfolio development because there's a lot of models, talent, and actors that were needing headshots. Um, so that was kind of my uh, insertion into into the uh, photography world there, I guess. And I had a, a photography studio that we operated for uh, for six years. Well, I was in Japan for six years. We operated the studio for just over four, four and a half. And uh, we had at our largest, I think we were 12 employees. And we took on a lot of localization campaigns for foreign brands operating in Japan. So a lot of European, French, uh, French, Italian, German brands that were uh, had really good marketing campaigns where they were but they needed to localize it for the Japanese market. So we did a lot of uh, <clears throat> reshoots, tweaking copy, um, bus station ads, train station ads, billboards, TV, things like that. So 12 people in a studio, that's not a small studio. No, it was, uh, it was a pretty good operation. We had, uh, well, we had, a, had a studio manager, several photographers, video editor, graphic designer, videographer, uh, hair and makeup. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a team that we... Yeah, and then we employed a lot of um, kind of part-time occasional work and we operated a lot of pop-up shops and um, yeah, so pop-up shops, product launches and things like that, that would require more staff to, to man the event. 
Nice. So you are you are a, a person with lots of skills. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I heard your interview on the CBC radio. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, there was something about you uh, being an engineer as well. Uh, I studied. Yeah, I studied. I'm not an engineer, but I did study engineering at Royal Military College. Um, I was I was in the military uh, in the pilot program for uh, for a shorter time. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I studied engineering at uh, Royal Military Co College in Kingston, Canada. And uh, mm -hmm. it was actually when I left there, that's when I moved to Australia. And uh, I'm from a farm originally, so farm work in Australia was pretty good transition and good way to experience the culture there. So you're like a partial engineer. Uh, you're a farmer. <laughs> well, you're an, a, a linguist. Uh, I, yeah, and... I, I speak English, Japanese, and I'm, I'm working on French and Scottish Gaelic right now. <laughs> nice. And you're... Uh, and you studied acting as well. Uh, I didn't study acting per se, but I did. Um, I did work. Uh, I did some jobs. I did a, a, t a movie in Japan, uh, which well, a movie and a lot of TV shows, commercials, and and things of that nature in Japan, and mm -hmm. uh, in person events as well. But yeah, I was actually really fortunate. Um, <clears throat> right before I, I right before I left Japan, I got to uh, have a, a fairly a decent speaking part in a very large production with. Um, Tadanabu Asano, who uh, he played, uh, <clears throat> he was in uh, Thor Ragnarok and the Thor movies, where uh, he was killed by Kate Blanchett, sadly, but, uh, but an amazing Japanese actor, and it was really cool being to uh, being able to share the, the screen with a lot of legendary Japanese talent like him and many others. I am impressed. <laughs> so, uh, before we get into this uh, dramatic image, um, Nifel, sorry, how do you pronounce it again? Nifel? Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah the, the Norse, so it's a Norse word, uh, meaning the realm okay. of mist and ice. And it's, um, uh -huh. so uh, I went to Swedish camp. I'm, I'm not Swedish, but I went to Swedish camp when I was a kid and then I was a counselor there. Uh, so yeah, there's, um, in Norse, mytho mis uh, Norse mythology, there is, um, there's there's a few realms in their cosmology. And one of them is, is Nifelheim. And mm -hmm. And that is, uh, so it was the realm of ice and mist and is kind of a, a foreboding, um, uh, kind of desolate, like the world of the dead. And it's got a very cold feel. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of mountains. And so this, this scene just kind of reminded me of that, that image in my mind of, of Norse cosmology. Oh, so this name is not the name of the mountain. It's, it's a name that you've um, kind of been inspired with. That that's right. Yeah, the mountains themselves, um, ironically, are actually just north of Valhalla Provincial Park in British Columbia, which oh, yeah. is uh, Valhalla Provincial Park also has a lot of um, Scandinavian influence in it. Obviously, the name Valhalla. Um, but yeah, it's uh, so it's kind of in that same area, and I do know there's a lot of Scandinavian settlers in that area. But uh, but that particular title comes from Norse mythology, not from the mountain itself. Yeah. Now talking of inspiration, this is not. This is not just a straight shot. This is your skill in seeing um, seeing the shot, and then also your skill in post processing that has uh, arrived at this image. Are there any photographers that influence uh, your style? Would you say? Oh, <clears throat> tons of photographers have influenced my style. Um, I don't know if this particular image represents uh, a specific individual in in particular, but yeah, certainly. There have been a lot of photographers that have influenced my, you know, my journey, and that I, I see their images and, you know, uh, are quite inspired by. Obviously, Ansel Adams for landscapes. It's very hard to <clears throat> be a landscape photographer without looking at him. Galen Roll um, is another one who did a lot of work in um, kind of Yosemite area, Eastern California, Bishop uh, near Bishop mm -hmm. California. Um, <clears throat> when I lived in Australia, uh, so Peter Lick, uh, fairly. Well, he's famous now, I guess at the time. So I, when I went back to photo school, I, I said one of my inspirations was Peter Lick and no one knew who he was. And then, you know, yeah. 10 years later, it was, <laughs> it was pretty, pretty household name in the world of photography. Yeah. Um, but I went to his, um, his gallery. I was, I was in Port Douglas in Queensland and he had a gallery in Cairns, Cairns, uh, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, Australians would not like to hear Cairns, but he had a gallery in Cairns, Australia, and I just I thought it was very spectacular. It was large format. He shot uh, a lot of 617 medium format slash large format film in the day and shot in the panoramic 617 format and printed very large, and I thought those were quite beautiful. So 
yeah, so I'd say Peter Lick was was an early influence of mine, as well as Andre Apps, who is a New Zealand photographer who shot <clears throat> more in the six twelve still panoramic format. But um, panoramas, I think, uh, have inspired me a lot with my landscape photography. Let's talk about this image. Um, was this a planned image? Uh, were you just um, hiking through and you happened upon this uh, uh, glorious scene? Uh, how did it come about? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, I, I guess I was like hiking, I guess you could say, through the area. So I'm pretty familiar with that area. Mm -hmm. um, I had, uh, so this particular shot was taken in the Purcell Mountains. So I had been out in British Columbia with my younger brother ski touring. And we spent, uh, I think it was about eight or nine days total in the uh, Purcell Mountains, as well as the uh, Rogers Pass in the Selkirk Mountains, which is neighboring nearby. And uh, based on the avalanche conditions and the weather, we would choose where we'd go for the day. So I had been to this spot before. And, uh, but uh, yeah, and as you said, this, uh, there's a lot of post-production in this particular image, which is a departure from my usual photographic uh, method where I do plan trips out. So I usually at least a year in advance, I'm planning my trips to try to hit the specific spot at the right season, obviously the right time of day. I'll, I'll look at meteorological conditions, um, you know, star conditions, where, where's the moon gonna be? Um, so there's a lot of consideration that goes into planning a shoot like that. Um, and then there's a lot of luck as well. You don't know if you're going to get cloud cover. You don't know, you know, there's a lot of unforeseen things. You might get rained out. You never know what's going to happen. So you do the best that you can to plan. Um, and then I very often will revisit that exact same spot multiple times. Um, so this shot is kind of unique in that it's, uh, it's single exposure. There's not a lot of work done in camera. Um, there's a lot of post-production and I was trying to recreate the scene from the way I felt when I was there. Um, the other difficulty with ski touring specifically is we are contending with, um, you know, minimal daylight hours in the winter in Canada. We're contending with varying avalanche conditions and the best light, I'm sure you know, for landscape photography, golden hour, blue hour, you know, when it's low in the sky. So early in the day, like dusk, dawn are really good times to shoot. That unfortunately is a very dangerous time to go ski touring because you don't want to be left on the mountain uh, when the sun goes down. So it can lead to a lot of, a lot of problems. So, um... So we were uh, touring through this area, and so I, I knew this the spot. I knew where I wanted to shoot, and um, uh, and actually I love this spot so much. Uh, we actually chartered a helicopter to go back to a very similar spot, maybe a couple couple miles away, um, for an early morning sunrise. So as soon as the sun rose, got a helicopter ride to the top of a mountain. Beautiful sunrise, very dramatic lighting. Um, but this is still the image that I that I particularly liked from that, and uh, the image itself is is quite uh, the raw file very very flat. Um, generally, when I shoot, I expose to the right, so I try to get um, you know as much detail as I can without blowing the highlights. Uh, which, when I shoot during very contrasty lighting times, is uh, there's a lot of dynamic range. So my images usually become very dark, and in which case I might employ methods like exposure bracketing, so I can extend my dynamic range, do an HDR image. Uh, I tend to do a lot of focus stacking, a fair bit of stitching, but um, and maybe if I have my tilt shift lens, I might do a tilt in order to extend the depth of field. But this particular shot, um, <clears throat> single exposure, very, very flat lighting, um, very not a lot of dynamic range, not a lot of contrast. And uh, I ended up getting a very nice bright image, so I had a lot of, um, it, the conditions were actually fairly bright. And then I, I built the scene um, to what you see in the image right now. Real quick, because I want to get into this image as well. Um, I know there's a lot that goes into preparation to get the image and then dealing with uh, conditions and things like that. Yeah. But if we look at, you said you, you, you sometimes you even spend about a year uh, preparing. Mm -hmm. How do you research <laughs> where you want to go and photograph? Yeah, that's a really good question, Manpreet. Um, I guess for, for young photographers wanting to do it, there's there's no better experience in training than just getting out there and shooting, you know, responding to the environment. And then you kind of can, can kind of see what works, what doesn't work, what you want to change for the future. And if you're like, okay, this time of day is really good, then you start in your mind developing an idea. It's like, okay, I want to be here at this time because the light's going to, you know, fill this valley in this particular way. Um, so I do... The way I research, so so yeah, I might be planning for a year, sometimes more. I've been trying to get a shot of Moraine Lake for, oh, it's getting close on a decade now, and I haven't got the shot that I want. So I know where I want to shoot it. I know all the conditions, and I just I've been there probably eight or nine times, 
to uh, to try to get the shot, but I want the atmospheric conditions to be just perfect, and uh, so I keep going back to certain spots. Um, but when I am planning, uh, I love cartography, I love maps, so I'll, I'll be looking at a lot of maps, a lot of 3D maps, topo uh, topographical maps with um, elevation circles so we can kind of uh, see the valley or, or see the scene that I'm at. And then planning for, uh, so I'll use, uh, like Photopills is a really good planning app, uh, that's one that I use. So I use Photopills, I use Windy, uh, there's Aurora Pro which tells me the Kepler value, like when I can anticipate to see a, a decent Aurora Borealis. Um, but I like to, like, obviously I like to shoot Milky Way when there's a new moon, because you don't want to have the light pollution from, from the moon. So uh, looking at maps, understanding an area, understanding the path of the sun through that area, where it's going to be at a certain time. Um, and then and then cloud cover. So just understanding, you know, what the clouds are going to be like. I love having, you know, like medium high stratus clouds with underlit. Uh, as the sun is setting, it pops underneath and you get this beautiful underlight with, uh, you know, stratus or like some cumulostratus clouds where you've got a little bit of depth and, um, and texture in there. Um, but again, it's a lot of it is trial and error too. So I have a shot of Moline Lake that of Spirit Island and I did a week long kayak trip to uh, Spirit or to Moline Lake. And I went back five times during that week to try to get the shot that I, that I finally got and I was happy with. <laughs> Patience. Uh, uh, patient. Actually, I was reading on Andre Apps. The uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. I, um, he was the New Zealand photographer. Um, reading reading his book about his approach kind of inspired that as well because he would spend like he would camp out for weeks just waiting for the right conditions, and he might not even take a photo the whole time that he was there. And I think that's uh, like that's an important lesson: is it's not going to be you go, you get it, you can plan, you're guaranteed. There's a lot of there's a lot of, uh, you're at the mercy of mother nature a lot of the time. So yeah. um, the other part, uh, you know, for aspiring landscape photographers is just enjoy being out in the landscape. So I, I love hiking. I love mountaineering and alpinism and ice climbing, rock climbing and all sorts of things like that. So I love being out there. Um, the photography is just a nice merger of, the, of my interests. Yeah. Now, um, obviously, hiking is another of your passions mm -hmm. and... Um, uh, you got this during one of your hikes. What kind of gear do you pack up uh, on your hikes? Yeah, uh, really good question. So, um, so for for that particular one, so we were we were ski touring or split boarding. So we, we my brother and I both split board. So we've got uh, snowboards that convert into skis, so we can zigzag ski up the mountain, so we can skin up the mountain, and then we snowboard down on on the ridge. So um, rather than just photographic gear, so I'm bringing. Um, uh, specifically, I'm bringing usually one one body. Sometimes I bring two bodies, but because we're hiking up a mountain with a lot of gear, I like to keep my pack light. Having said that, <laughs> these are the lenses I usually bring. So, not the lightest lens. Um, so I bring specifically my. So all of my commercial work I shoot almost primarily prime lenses. I love prime lenses. Um, for a lot of my landscape work and a lot of my. Um, yeah, a lot of my landscape work, I do tend to use zoom lenses because it gives me a lot of versatility. Um, that having been said, if I know what I'm shooting, I'll probably bring a prime. But if I'm going environments where I'm going to be adapting, I'll bring my uh, my 12 to 24, which is a zoom lens for I, I shoot uh, right now. I shoot Sony. Uh, I bring the 24 to 105, and then I bring the 100 to 400 with a two times teleconverter. So that way, I'm covered from focal ranges from 12 millimeters all the way up to 800 millimeters, and uh, yeah, and that gives me pretty good coverage. Um, I almost always bring my carbon fiber uh, tripod, my travel tripod with spiked feet. Uh, I can't stress enough the importance of having spiked feet if you're doing landscape photography and a removable center column so you can get nice and low. Um, so in addition to photography gear, um, I'm also going to be bringing, when I'm ski touring, I'm obviously bringing my avalanche gear. So uh, I'm bringing a helmet for snowboarding. I'm bringing my, um, I might bring an ice axe. I might bring my crampons. Um, should I need them, but I've always got my beacon, so my, like if I get buried in an avalanche, then my brother can retrieve me. Um, I've got my my snow probe, so I can see the dead, like I can find my brother <laughs> or, or my partners if if the worst happens. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then my shovel, so we can dig them out. So those are, that's pretty common avalanche safety gear is the uh, shovel, beacon, and probe. Um, I also bring my, I have an Atlas um, pack. So when I do uh, like ski touring or day hikes, I have an, a 40 liter Atlas pack that has a spot for 
um, for my camera gear specifically. And then on the back side, I've got all of my avalanche gear, my extra clothes, my food, whatever I need, my water. And um, yeah, and that's more or less my, my gear for, for a ski touring event. And then my gear would change depending on whether I'm doing summer travel or, or um, shoulder season or, or whatever activity I'm doing. Hmm. Uh, safety first is very important. It, it, oh, and, um, and on the safety note too, I mean, we do bring beacon, uh, sho uh, shovel, and probe in case something happens. But the best safety is just planning beforehand. So we like we also I also bring my Garmin inReach, like my satellite communicator. I bring you know proper glacier goggles if I'm on a glacier or in in very high visibility uh, spots. We bring two-way radios if we need to communicate. Um, so we do, and, and we look at, obviously look at the Avalanche, um, like Avalanche Canada's website prior to going and we have a plan. We, yeah. So planning is the most important safety, um, yeah, safety thing. Yeah. We can do a whole podcast just on that. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, what, uh, what was your choice of camera there? Um, for, the uh, Sony for what? yeah, so I, I shoot primarily the Sony a seven R four right now. Uh, or the A7R series. Um, I'm getting a five as well, but um, yeah, I tend to like for my stills, like for my landscape work, the uh, Sony A7R series because uh, the higher resolution is something that I quite like. Right. Um, I hate shooting weddings with that, so I use my, uh, my <laughs> Sony A7, A7IVs for weddings. Mm -hmm. And um, and in Japan, in studio, I would um, from time to time use a Phase One camera. And uh, yeah, the Phase One XT, the the technical camera, is one that I'm I'm looking at uh, making a purchase for right now. Nice. And uh, your tripod, uh, you said carbon fiber. Yeah, Do you carbon remember which fiber. One it was. Uh, yeah, I use a, a Peak Design travel tripod. So uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, I, I I have kind of the Peak Design ecosystem. So I've got like four capture clips. I've got um, you know all their mobile like mobile stuff. There's there's a lot of gear that they like that I that, I, that they make that I do like. Um, but yeah, the travel tripod is extremely lightweight. It's very low profile, spiked feet, removable center column. You can undersling it. Um, Arca Swiss, very compatible head. Like, yeah, it's, it's a really yeah, good, fine. yeah, really good photography. Fine tripod. Yeah. Yeah. My studio tripod's a big man Frodo and it's heavy, but, uh, yeah, lightweight gear is definitely king when you're going up and down mountains all day. True. And when you're traveling, uh, do you back up your images? What's backup? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, I actually just got back from leading a tour in, uh, in Ecuador with my good friend, Jordan Cutbill. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, yeah, if you don't have three copies of your data, it's, you don't have a copy of it. So we're, we're very adamant on that. And for that particular trip, um, because, because what I do, so, um, here on my desk, I've got a, uh, a 64 terabyte, um, RAID 6 NAS that's, um, that's redundant. And then I back up to the cloud as well. Um, you don't always have access to that when you're traveling. So I do travel with uh, obviously my SD cards when I shoot. And then whenever I can, I back those up onto uh, a solid state drive, uh, sorry, my SD cards. And then I back it up into an SSD solid state drive when I'm at a hotel or wherever I happen to be. Um, Cause we were in the Amazon jungle for five days. There was no service, no internet. Um, There's absolutely no coverage for us to, uh, to back up when we were in the jungle. Um, although we did get updates for the Oilers playoffs hockey uh, run by uh, satellite. <laughs> we had satellite updates on the score. Yeah, I think we've kept our viewers in suspense long enough. Let's get into this image and sure. uh, talk about how you created it. Yeah, sure. Show I'll us just, the magic. I'll share my screen now. Yeah, sure. I'll just walk you through a little yeah. bit of uh, this particular sure. image. So... Uh, so as I said, this particular image is, is a bit of a departure from my usual way of editing um, in that a lot of it is done in, in software. So I use probably for 90% of my editing, I use Capture One, which is the program that we're in right here. Um, Capture One is made, uh, Phase One Phase One makes the cameras, Capture One is their software arm. So it's a raw processor and um, I, don't, I don't actually use Adobe products, but I, I do use Capture One and then I use Affinity Photo if I'm doing something that requires a little more manipulation. Um, so yeah, I can show you, the, this is obviously the after with kind of the mood painted in and it is a dramatic difference from the flat raw file, which I'm gonna pop on now. So as you can see, I'll just drag the slider kind of back and forth. Here's the raw file. So typically, most of my raw files are going to be a lot darker than this uh, because I do expose to the right. So I expose as far as I can to the right without, without uh, blowing my highlights. 
Um, so for this particular image, you know, comes from a flat image to a pretty moody and dramatic color graded image. And uh, I do have a layered file here that I can show you kind of the, the process that I do to go, go to that. That's quite right. dramatic a difference. It's, it's a dramatic shift, yeah. And it's uh, and like I said, it's it's uh, interesting for me to look at because um, most of the time I do a lot of the work in in camera. Mm -hmm. um, but this one, just due to the you know being there, uh, I can't remember the exact time that it was shot, but the, you know the sun sets around four thirty ish. So we want to be off the mountain by that time in a perfect world. Mm -hmm. um, so for the uh, yeah the background base layer, so here's the raw image originally. So my first adjustments, I'm just darkening it. So I'm dropping the exposure down, I'm increasing contrast, and I'm applying a slight color grade to the shadows. Yeah, so I bump the contrast up to 50, drop the exposure almost two stops, and then using the color balance tool, I drag the shadows down to give it that, that colder, cooler blue tone. Uh, then I added a contrast layer just to bring a little more contrast and drama into the scene. And then is a clarity layer. So this particular clarity layer, layer I'm using the clarity slider, which is a micro contrast. So it's affecting the contrast and mainly the mid-tones. And then I would be painting a mask in for this. And this looks like a hand-painted mask. Uh, yeah, that would be hand-painted. So I would use my, my tablet or my mouse even just to kind of paint this in. So the, uh, the clarity is only affecting the mountains. Um, I don't always do it this way, but for the sky, I usually want a softer sky and more detail in the foreground, just because I don't want the sky competing and to look too, uh, to be competing. I want it to be softer, generally speaking. Um, so the haze, that would be me doing the complete opposite on the sky. So I'm taking, again, the clarity slider, dragging it to the left to reduce that contrast, and then painting it into the clouds, which gives them a little bit softer, smoother, ethereal feel. Um, there's a few, I don't know if you can probably see them here, there's a few, not really inversions or thermoclines, but there's um, yeah, certain thermal layers that create these lines through the clouds, which I find a little distracting. So I clean those up just using the healing tool. Just so that there's not diagonal lines going through the image, distracting the viewer's eye. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like I've built in another dodge layer here. So. Uh, yeah, so in this case, the dodge layer is affecting specifically the highlights, and if I turn on the mask, we can see just the red areas are the areas being affected by this dodge or this lighten layer. Mm -hmm. um, so I generally, um, I do paint in a little by hand, but for this particular one, I, I tend to do a luminance range, in which case I'm limiting the luminance values that that dodge is applied to. So that's why you get just the, uh, I'll turn that uh, layer off and on. That's why you're getting that dramatic effect just in the highlight areas of the image. Mm -hmm. um, another vignette looks like I put on just to draw the viewer's eye more into the center of the image to the brighter spots. Second dodge layer, this would be, yeah, this would be, again, probably a painted in layer. Yeah, this would be like a hand painted layer. Is that on your end? Uh, the ambulance? Yeah, there's an ambulance yeah. going by. I'll, I'll give this a <laughs> sec. Okay, I think it's gone. Yeah. Um, and then this one, color grade central. Okay, so this one, I don't know if you can see it. I can see it on my display. I, I use a um, color managed system with with my monitor, so I can actually see a fairly dramatic difference here, but it might be subtle. Um, it's just a color grade affecting the center of the, of the image. Mm -hmm. That's adding just a little more blue and cool. Uh, it looks like I've got a third dodge layer. And this is probably, yeah, to bring uh, detail into some of the shadow areas. Um, so when I bumped up the contrast, it would have um, just crushed the blacks a little bit. So this is my way of uh, bringing the, a little more detail out in some of the trees here. And then this layer I don't usually add for, unless I'm doing a print. So this one is just for print work. So that might be a pretty dramatic shift between that and that. But those would be the final adjustments that I do to prep the image for print. Um, so I, again, like I said, I use a color managed workflow, so I cal calibrate my monitor at least once a month. Um, and then I've got the ICC profiles download, downloaded for the specific printer and substrate or paper combinations that I'm printing with. Um, I do do a fair bit of printing myself on an Epson um, P8000, um, but a lot of my, especially my acrylic face mount work, which I don't know if you can see behind me, um, I get them printed at White Wall in Germany. Um, mm -hmm. And so I've got their ICC profiles downloaded. And so what I'll do is I'll do some soft proofing on my screen. And 
can't see myself now. Uh, I do uh, soft proofing on my screen so that I can see what this image is going to look like when it's printed mm -hmm. on a specific paper with specific inks in uh, under the acrylic glass. So then I tweak my image. Once I've got my final edit, then I turn on that soft proofing and I tweak the image further because when you, anytime you print an image, it's going to change the way that it looks. When we're looking at a screen, it's a projected image. It's going to look different than, uh, than a print, which is a reflected image. Um, so I do a lot of soft proofing to make sure that what I see is, is matching what, um, yeah, is matching what I, what I want. And you do this pretty much all on the raw file in Capture One using layers. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. That image was it didn't leave Capture One. That's that is the original raw file to the finish the finished image. Um, and, and again, I don't like to, uh, especially if I'm you know branding it landscape. I don't do a lot of um, you know more fantastical edits. Like mm -hmm. everything that I've I've done there is something that I could have done in the darkroom. And yeah, and I kind of yeah. So. Um, so I, I did it's start shooting. It's almost like a toned black and white. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and maybe a, yeah, a cyanotype kind of inspiration with the yeah. Um, so I, I did learn photography by shooting film. Um, so I, I still have my my Linhoff, like my technical four by five camera, which I love. Mm -hmm. um, I just yeah, carting that up when I'm snowboarding is <laughs> is not it's something no that fun. I want to do. It's no fun. It's too big. Um, yeah. but, Those are amazing yeah. cameras. I, I learned on a Cinar. Okay. So yeah. The, yeah, they're yeah. incredible cameras. Like the resolution is is, you know, still pretty. Un I'd say probably phase one. I've got them beat now, but yeah. uh, the resolution's incredible. I love working with film, and then working in the dark room with traditional dodging and burning is uh, yeah, yeah it's something I, I quite like. Yeah, I remember all the Polaroids we used to uh, use yeah. as proofing uh, yeah, yeah. for clients in studios. Yeah, now we just look on the back of our uh, our, our cameras. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you wanted to share another screen? You said. Yeah, yeah. So I've got uh, yeah, just a couple behind the scenes from um, from that particular trip. So I do I do do a fair bit of uh, snowboarding with my brother. So I've got oh, there's one I was thinking of. Anyways, there's the the finished image which uh, did get the mm -hmm. judges' choice, got an excellent score, and best in class for fine art in 2022. Um, and these are yeah, some of the. It's kind of some shots from the trips. So this would be my brother and, and his friend when we were kind of going up. This would be in Rogers Pass. And what month was this? Uh, this was in January. So mm -hmm. I, I went, uh, I think I went to BC with him three times over between January and March. Um, so we had some days that were just, you know, very overcast and like kind of snowy like this. And, you know, even though it is cold, like I'm just wearing a, a fairly thin wool wool shirt. I've got my actual jacket in in my bag, but uh, because we're working so hard hiking up the mountain, it's uh, get a, quite a sweat. A little shot of my brother going off a cliff in slow motion on my iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so this is kind of what we we go for, and then uh, he's very patient in that he doesn't. Uh, complain too much when I stop for uh, for taking photos for quite a while. Uh, you lose a lot of friends when you're uh, when you're a landscape photographer, though. I can tell you yes. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these would have been some other shots from uh, either the same day or at least the same trip. Yeah. So I always go with Garmin, you know, Garmin InReach, uh, just in case I need something. This would be me uh, stopping, taking off my board, getting ready to set up probably a tripod shot here. Possibly, I don't know what I'd be doing with the tripod middle of the day, but... Yes, the little snowboarding video. So this is a blue sky day, so obviously not the same day that I shot the last one, but but yeah, we do you know a fair bit of kind of boot packing, hiking, and yeah, this is a uh, this is one I wanted to show. So uh, this is an avalanche probe getting deployed, uh, just testing the depth of the snow base where we were, and it was. Uh, Pretty dramatically deep this this particular trip. Oh wow! Yeah, right there. What's that? Three forty? Three twenty? Three twenty. Nice. So that's <clears throat> uh, where we were standing right here was on three point two meters of of snow before we were at the uh, the base of the mountain. Which, uh, wow! So. That much depth of snow was right under your feet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Three point two meters of nothing but snow beneath us. But when we stand on it, it packs down, and it's yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah. But 
this is kind of the uh, the proofs that I get when I do a print with uh, okay. like with white wall. So mm -hmm. uh, I, like there's a color checker. I will compare it um, to my computer screen, which unfortunately is not in this shot. But yeah, so I will check the colors against the screen when I do my soft proofing just to make sure that I've got uh, a color managed workflow and everything looks the way that I want it to. That's your other award winning shot which we got to get you back for. Yeah, yeah, that one is too. Yeah, it'd be lovely too. Yeah, this this one, um, it did get me some pretty good awards with um, PPOC, the Epson uh, Panel Awards, and also International Landscape Photographer of the Year Awards. Tell us a little bit about your um, workshops and tours. What is yeah, it that um, you do and how can, um, you know, people take advantage of that? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I do lead workshops uh, mm -hmm. internationally. So I've uh, I've done them in in Ecuador, in Japan, like South America, in Japan, North America, and um, and I'm actually I'm moving to Scotland next uh, next May. So I'll be uh, I'll be based out of Edinburgh um, from next May, and I plan to be running some on the Isle of Skye, in the Kangaroos, and kind of in the Highlands of Scotland, like Wales, in all over the UK, as well as other parts of Europe and Scandinavia. And I'll still be running tours in uh, in South America. I'm planning one next year for Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the tours are great. Uh, I've got uh, my Yukon one this year is filled up, unfortunately, but I'll just stop sharing for a sec. Um, I've got a trip uh, going up to the Yukon in Tombstone Territorial Park, uh, where we're helicoptering in and we're doing uh, sunrise, sunset shots and then helicoptering out. Um, but yeah, the tours are... Uh, I've got different tours for people of all ages. So if you're an experienced, you know, hiker or alpinist and you want to, you know, just get some amazing shots, I've got tours that will cater to that, as well as people who are maybe not wanting to do, you know, a 40-kilometer hike or something. We can, uh, they're just shorter hikes. Uh, but essentially, there there's weekend workshops, there's day workshops where I do astrophotography workshops. Um, we talk about a lot of meteorology, uh, kind of planning around the weather, what time of day to shoot, uh, techniques like focus stacking, panorama, uh, panoramic stitching, HDR blending, and um, yeah, I feel like just a few kind of technical uh, things we talk about. Uh, talk about like artistic statement, what we're looking for, um, you know, a little bit about the area that we're in, you know, the flora, the fauna, the nature, the history, the, um, you know, kind of like a guided value add that's not just photography, but it more holistically looks at the whole approach of, of backpacking. And uh, it's just, uh, this is a little video, um, kind of a little a uh, highlight reel, kind of, uh, I guess what you call it, a little, a little stinger that kind of uh, talks a little bit about my tours. And what level of photographer does one have to be to really take uh, full advantage of your... Uh, beginner to advance. Absolutely beginner to advance. So even if you're shooting with an iPhone, you want to get the most out of how to shoot with your iPhone. If you don't want to bring all the heavy gear, uh, you just want to know a lot of things, that's great. Uh, if you have you know, a technical view camera and you want to learn about you know, tilting, shifting, and uh, you know, shift blends, or like you know, the shine fluke principle where you're tilting to extend your depth of field... Um, uh, yeah, there's uh, caters caters to anyone who wants to come, or even like even very advanced. I have two uh, very advanced internationally published professionals that are coming to Tombstone. Um, so one has galleries of his own. He lives in Los Angeles. He's a very very established photographer and very talented. Uh, but he's coming up to Tombstone as well to uh, just because it's a unique spot. It's very hard to gain access to the park. Um, and that way, you get to go with like-minded individuals. You get to learn from each other. And uh, it's not, not always just about teaching. Sometimes it's about camaraderie, just having a really good time and making lifelong friends. Um, especially on the longer tours that I do. Like, my, my kind of signature tours are about six days. And, um, you know, they include helicopter rides, zodiac rides, uh, maybe uh, sledding, like skidooing out to certain locations. Not national parks, obviously, but... Um, on Crown Land, uh, just getting unique access to places that people don't always get to go. I've also worked with the Parks Department at Dinosaur Provincial Park to get access for the tours to the restricted area of the park and to, um, you know, just to get some really unique value-added uh, experiences for people. 
And um, yeah, any any level of any level that someone, if they're interested in the outdoors and getting the most out of their camera or just getting a great shot at the right time of day in the right spot, that's a tour for you. Shine fluke, shine fluke's principle. Yeah. That's a term I have not heard for a heard very for a while, yeah. very long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, where is uh, a place online that? people can get more information about yeah, uh, yeah for my tours yeah, um sharko sharkostudios.com or evanwill.ca mm -hmm. they both uh, they're both my websites but yeah sharkostudios.com will is my website my tours are on there um and you can sign up for a mailing list so i, I do do mailing lists where i when i launch new tours people mm -hmm. can be on the mailing list they get first access because the tours like my tombstone tour is filled up my skyline jasper tour is filled up i've got two spots left on the tonkin valley tour um, but yeah, the tours do fill up pretty quickly. So, um, yeah, uh, the mailing list would be great or send me an email at evan at sharkostudios.com. Great. I will put all these links in the show notes. And, um, if you are looking to, um, any one of the viewers are looking to expand their horizon in, uh, in landscape photography. You have to go on to it on uh, Evan's web website and take a look at some amazing images that he has, he has created. I mean, one can easily lose a couple of hours just going through the images there. Well, thank you so much for sharing your uh, time and your knowledge. My pleasure, man. Um, thank you. It has been such a pleasure. Very nice talking with you. Thank you for having me on. You're welcome.